Yes, blast off. How many of you are a little soggy? A little wet out there. It's so good to be here and worship this morning where it's dry and wonderful. I want to share a couple of announcements with you this morning. Welcome you here to the Grace Place today for worship. Uh, we're getting ready to head in October back to Honduras, should the Lord tarry, for another medical missions trip. But we're also going to do some work there in some Bible school and other things. If you'd like to be a part of that, there are little cards out at the information desk that give you the breakdown on what it costs to go on that trip and also when those payments are due. We'd love to get you on that list. We have 15 tickets uh, reserved to be a part of that. And especially if you're in the medical field, uh, we'd love to have you help us with the medical mission there. Though. So pick up that today if you would. Also tonight, new rotation of our life groups begin. If you're a life group leader, there are the... Uh, curriculum packets are available out at the information desk too. It'll get you through the four weeks. If you're not a part of a life group and you'd like to just follow along with what we're studying during those four weeks, you can pick up one of those. I think we have enough of those out there for you today. I'd like to welcome this morning our uh, women's ministry coordinator, in, uh, Ms. Jill Franz, and she has a special announcement for you. Good morning. Well, thanks. Uh, the women's ministry is really excited to announce that we're starting a new ministry. It is a card ministry. If you are currently um, a card writer, a card maker, we would love to talk to you and get you a little bit more involved. But to explain it a little bit, this box will be on the information desk. And inside it is love just waiting to be sent in the mail. We have cards. And on those cards is a name of a person who is in need of some encouragement of some sort. It has their address on it. You can either glue this on the envelope that has the stamp already provided for you on it. On the back of the envelope, it has an explanation as to why you're sending the card. Ongoing health challenges, loss of a spouse, need of a job. If you have someone in mind that you would like to send a card, there's also a box within the box that says leave the name and address of the person that you would like to have sent the card and we would love to provide you or anyone the opportunity to receive encouragement, to send encouragement. It is non-committal, except for when you take that card, you are committing to pray for the person for a week. And um, we think that this is a good way to start connection in our church through the women. And if you will, please stand with me, greet your neighbor with love, and tell them that it's nice to see them. Come 
so thankful for that way, Father, that you prepared and that you made for us. And God, we just pray that we would just boldly step into it today, that God, what you've done for us in the past, and Father, what we've read from your book, God, will give us the confidence, Father, to step out on faith, God, into an area, Father, where we may feel like we'll just fall, to where we feel like you don't have us, but help us, help to remind us that that's the very definition of faith. God, not the absence of doubt, but the stepping out in the presence of doubt. God, knowing that you have the promises in place to take care of us. And God, help us to worship today, Father, regardless of our situation, regardless of the things that we're in, God, regardless of the motions that we may have carried into this place today. Father, be, because we know that you are eternal. Father, that you've set an eternal precedent. God, that you don't waver according to our emotions, but God, help us to have the confidence just to step out and just to put those things into practice and just to be able to say your name will ever be on our lips. Your name will ever be on our lips, regardless of our circumstance or our situation. We love you. We pray that we honor you with this time. In your name we pray, amen.
Man, it's good this morning. How many of you guys needed that this morning, just to be able to say, I'll praise you regardless of what's happening in my life. But things aren't going exactly like my flesh really wants them to go. I'm in an uncomfortable place. But uh, the command that we have is to step out in obedience and praise regardless of our circumstances. Sometimes we were even talking about this back there. Just that discipline to step out into the things that we've done before, we know are the right things to do, bring us back into a place of faith. So, uh, man, that's good. You guys, you guys take a seat, and we're going to go ahead and bring our ushers forward this morning and take up our morning offering as an extension of our worship. This is just another part of our worship here at the Grace Place. If you're new, we just pray that even if we don't feel like it, that our giving is done in joy. And this is a part of our sacrifice of praise. And so, Father, this is yours. Uh, God, we, we offer it to you fully, holy, God, and, and with our best intentions. Uh, and we just pray that we would just be able to do it joyfully as well. God, take it and uh, send it out for your good work among your people. Father, to those that are in need that may not even know you, God, that they can be reached through these resources. In your name we pray. Amen. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now Will not fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Is working all things out And yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley And yes, I will Bless your name Oh yes, I will Sing for joy When my heart is heavy For all my days Oh yes, I will I turn on what the same God that never fails will not fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never vain, is working all things out, is working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will see for joy when my heart is heavy for all my. 
great song. I, uh, Margaret and I, of course, uh, met each other traveling in a singing group for our college back at Gulf Coast Bible College, and uh, we had an unusual courtship and, uh, and breaking up and then getting engaged all on a bus. <laughs> Try that dating plan where you see each other all day long, all day. But uh, we, we really, it was a great way to get to know someone from morning till night. Can't get away from them. But uh, thank the Lord for that relationship. We, after we finished that tour with that group, we got engaged and we were married the next year and we traveled in a group with another couple, our good friends Rich and Julie Cloyd. And uh, we liked to go to concerts and see what other people were doing in ministry and sharing. And we went, there was a concert all over Houston where we were in college. There would be a Christian concert almost every night. So we, we decided to go see this famous a gospel pianist, and he had albums out. He was on the radio, and he was a tremendous piano player, and he did these incredible styles and different versions of great songs. And so while we were there, they had an opening act, a guy that he kind of was the uh, Rat Pack singer of gospel music. Can you imagine? He was kind of cool jazz sound in gospel music. And he was there as the opening act for this piano player. And so being people who traveled and sang all the time, we... We observed whatever they did, you know, and how they presented themselves because we wanted to be effective in our ministry. And uh, during the opening prayer, while the pastor was praying, the, the cool jazz singer guy was checking his hair. Margaret, you know, we're supposed to be praying, but Margaret's going, Tommy, look at him. He's checking his hair. His hair looked just perfect. Co- you know, co- why do you say that? Coiffed. We don't use that word in Mississippi. That was not in the lingo. Quaffed. So then he, he does his thing. I, I wasn't really into that. I thought it was kind of weird, you know. Frank Sinatra meets gospel. Kind of weird. But he got done with his deal. And then the great, the guy we came to see came out. And he sat at the grand piano. And he begins to play. And it's this incredible arrangement. And it, as it gets to a crescendo, he's playing his piano. And he stands up and looks at the crowd and goes. We were not impressed. He was tremendous. His style was incredible. He's one of the greatest musicians I've ever heard. But at that moment, it stopped being about ministry, and it started being about him. You say, well, come on, give the guy a break. No, there was just something that just didn't sell. I didn't buy another record after that. Between the guy checking the hair and and trying to think, is it really about me? And I wondered, you know, where, where was the heart in all of this? It's interesting that the study that uh, Kinnaman and Gabe Lyon did a few years ago came out with a book called Unchristian. They used Barna's research. Barna is the great Christian researcher who checks all these things. And I, and I put this quote in your notes this morning because I wanted you to see this. This is the way people in our day perceive us. It says, outsiders consider us hypocritical, saying one thing and doing another. They are skeptical of our morally superior attitudes. They say Christians pretend to be something unreal, conveying a polished image. You see what I'm saying? A polished image that is not accurate. I think the guy had a toupee on. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. Christians think the church is only a place for virtuous and morally pure people. And and it was something that just didn't seem real to me at that concert that night. There's something that bothered me about it. There's just something that seemed like it was put on and and faked. And isn't that hard to hear that perhaps the world out there that wants to see something real is looking at us and saying, you know what, they're more worried about making sure everything looks just perfect than they are about being genuine. I'll tell you, there's one of the great... uh, I think representatives of the, of the body of Christ is a, a young singer by the name, well, she's not young anymore, she's, she's older, but her name's Sheila Walsh. She was a Christian singer, writer. She used to be the co-host of the 700 Club. And she talks about how disconnected, spirit, her disconnected spirituality caused her to hit a wall. One morning she said, I was sitting on national television and I had on my nice suit and my inflatable hairdo. That was her words. And that night, I was in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital. 
The first, very first day in the hospital, she says, the psychiat- psychiatrist asked me, who are you? She said, I'm the co-host of the 700 Club. The psychiatrist said, that's not what I mean. She said, well, I'm a writer and I'm a singer. He said, that's what you do, but who are you? And she looked at him and she said, I don't have a clue. And he replied, now that's why you're here. Sheila goes on to say, I measured myself by what other people thought of me, and that was slowly killing me. Before I entered the hospital, some of the 700 Club staff said to me, don't do this. You will never regain any kind of platform again. If people know you are in a mental institution and on medication, it's over. And I said, you know what? It's over anyway, so I can't think about that. I really thought, she said, that I had lost everything, my house, my salary, my job, everything, but I found my life. I discovered at the lowest moment of my life that everything that was true about me, listen, everything that was true about me, God knew. God knew. There are some seasons and times of life where I believe we have an opportunity to reconnect with who we really are. Not, not the roles that we play in life, not the fake smiles that we wear, not the opinion that's in, that, that imposes a fake persona on my life, but I think to reconnect with the person who we really are, who God created us to be. We talked last week about being called to be a servant, but what does that life style look like on a daily basis. And I think we have to come to a moment where someone asks us what the psychiatrist asked Sheila Walsh, not about what we do, but about who we are. Who we are. Uh, And it's not about what we do when you hear the term service. Sometimes you think about what can I do? Well, service is what I do. No, I think if we're going to identify with what Jesus is really saying, service has to be about the essence of who we are. Shakespeare said it this way in As You Like It. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Boy, I'm deep today. I quoted Shakespeare. (laughs) But isn't that that true? That all the life, we, we, we make entrance and exits into life and we become different people. We take on different roles and we try to be all these different people. But living poured out involves being real. It involves being transparent. It involves being genuine. An encounter with Jesus should change us in some way. Don't you agree? But often I feel like we simply, when we come to Christ, we just put on a new mask and we pretend to be someone that we are not. And and I think we have to come to a moment where, where, as Sheila Walsh says, everything that was true about me, God knows. God knew. So the question comes up, is it okay for me to be me? And is it possible to be transformed into living a submissive and servant lifestyle before God? Well, I believe that it is possible. And I don't just believe it's possible. I believe it's necessary for us to please God. Jesus in this scripture text this morning identifies the lifestyle that he, and in his term, He calls them hypocrites. He says, I want to to show you the lifestyle that hypocrites live, and I want to show you the lifestyle that servants live, who are simply loving me and following me. Now, I want us this morning to be confident in our salvation because of the sacrifice that he made for us. So don't fall into that trap of believing that we can earn salvation, because we can't. He paid that price for it. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. But we also understand that we are to respond to his grace by living a life that is set apart, a lifestyle of a servant. Can we agree on that? Well, even if you don't agree with me, I'm going to believe it and I'm going to preach it, okay? Matthew chapter 6, the first 15 verses. All three of these weeks when we've been talking about being poured out, we've been using the words of Jesus. Pretty good authority, don't you think? And this is what he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. 
Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for, from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I think that Jesus has just given us an incredible outline on the consistency of a servant lifestyle. What does a person look like? who's living not for other people and their approval, but who, are, who is living as a servant to God and for his approval. I love the fact that he uses this phrase, do not practice your righteousness. Righteousness. We should have a righteousness in our life. What does that mean? Righteousness is in right standing with God, not necessarily approved by all people, not necessarily applauded by all people, but we don't worry about that because we're righteous. And when we're righteous, we're living for his approval and we're in right standing with him. Our heart is right with God. And in the, Jesus said the greatest law is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Can you love your neighbor as yourself without loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind? No. So get that in order. Get it right. I, I, I go to uh, the message and it says, be especially careful when you're trying to be good that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but God, the God who made you won't be applauding. That a boy Peterson. He just has a way of saying it, doesn't he? It might be a good performance, but God's withholding his applause from that. Why do we need, why do we do the good things that we do? We as servants should be motivated by the will of our master, desiring to please him. Why? Because we fear him. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But no, because we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The, the King James in this text uses a, a very unique term called alms, A-L-M-S, alms. Uh, money or food or other donations given to the poor or needy. Anything that's given as charity. And the, the scripture talks many times about the beggars who were holding their hands out, hoping to receive something, alms for the poor. And the scripture says that Jesus went about in his life doing good. It was more about his nature than it was about his actions. And so let's put this together in our minds because God is good and Jesus is God. Jesus just spontaneously does good. He went about doing good because he was God and God is good. It begins with who Jesus is. And so my contention this morning is it, goodness in our life, righteousness, should begin with who we are. So we do good things because we are good, because we're in right relationships with the Father. Goodness should come from being filled with his presence. It naturally comes out when we live among other people. Why do we give alms? We give money or food or other donations to the poor or needy. We're going to explore the term compassion in our groups this week. Compassion is the topic tonight we'll be talking about. Compassion is a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is hurting in pain or has misfortune. And here's the rest of the, the phrase that sets compassion apart. 
and it is accompanied by a strong desire to help the suffering. Not just saying, oh my, that's terrible, but there's this desire to say, I've got to do something about that. Jesus was filled with compassion. A world was hurt and lost and dying, and Jesus said, well, I I hate that that's going on. God was in heaven watching his earth and, and, and all that was going on, but he was moved with compassion. I've got to do something. The hypocrites that Jesus talks about in this text did good things, but their motivation was not compassion or to obey God, but to earn some kind of credit or applause from people who saw them doing it. Who will notice if I do this good thing? Why am I doing this good thing? Is it more about us feeling good or about meeting a genuine need for the glory of God? That's, That's the question we have to ask. And so Jesus says, when you're practicing your righteousness, who do you want to applaud? Your friends, your family, the pe- your peers, the people around you. You want your boss at work to say, finally, good job, give me a raise. You know, give me some more money. Uh, why are you doing it? Why are you being good? Jesus is saying, when you do good, it's only for one person to applaud. And then he uses the term giving. When you give, he says, sound no trumpet before you. It, it was the custom for some in Jesus' day to draw attention to their giving so they would be known as generous people. Today, people do not sound a trumpet to project the image of generosity, but they still know how to call attention to their giving. What do we do in church life to call attention to those who give? Well, we don't sound a trumpet, but we put names on buildings or we put names on pews. We don't have pews. But in the old days, we put names on pews, and people would say, don't sit in my pew. And they literally meant that was my pew because they had the plaque on the end of the pew to prove it. Don't sit in my pew. We, that, so it's almost like we're sounding the trumpet. Hey, guess what? I gave enough money to buy a pew. It's my pew. Or we post plaques of recognition, or we put plaques on communion tables in the life of the church to let people know that this person gave. And uh, some think I'm exaggerating. But one church that I pastored told me that the former pastor had posted on the bulletin board a list of the top givers and the amounts that they had given on the church bulletin board so that everyone could see whose approval were they seeking, God's or man's. I said, well, don't worry, because as long as I'm pastor here, that will never happen again. Because I think the the motive was wrong. Don't go looking for that. Once again, the servant understands that giving is not about receiving anything back for ourselves. Could the people that Jesus touched ever match what he had done for them? No. Never. Do we want people to know what we have given? If so, then, then Jesus says, then we are sounding trumpets. We should do it secretly, privately. There was a missions trip worker who had traveled to Zambia and brought back pictures from her experience. And in the church, there were bags of grain lying in the church because the people there didn't have money, but they brought these bags of grain, a tithe, a 10% of their crop that they brought and gave to God. And people in Africa have very little, and yet they are very generous. Did you know that in this country, Surveys have revealed a similar result, that the people who are in the lowest income brackets are proportionately the most generous when it comes to giving to the church and to charity. Bill Gates may have given his fortune to help the poor, but among millionaires, he is the exception rather than the rule. Millionaires may do impressive looking bank transfers with lots of zeros attached on them, but proportionate to their income, they're basically stingy people. It is those on the minimum wage or on sometimes even on pensions and limited incomes who are often the most generous proportionately because they don't give that they may be praised by others. They give out of obedience to God. The third thing Jesus talks about here is prayer. And apparently, the hypocrites were incredible public prayers. I'm doing some digging and studying right now on praying that Jesus has asked us to do. And this is one of those texts that caused me to question 
having prayer in large groups or publicly. Because Jesus says this. He says, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And I've been stressing, and I almost hate to tell you about it because now I'm talking publicly about it. And Jesus says, secret. But I've been stressing to our prayer team on Wednesday nights that we are attempting to do what Jesus here said here. It's, it's not a, a, a big group, but there's a focus. We're, we're behind closed doors in my office, and it is a safe place for us to simply talk to Abba, Father, or Daddy. Listen, if you pray there, you don't need to be eloquent. You don't need theological training because we're just talking to our Father. Because Jesus said we should pray our Father. That means Daddy. So we're just talking to daddy, and we talk to him honestly and simply. Now, I've known people, and you probably have too, that when they begin to pray, their voice changed. Suddenly, they go into a pastoral sound, and they pray in King James English, and they don't use these and thous any other time except in the presence of, because God only understands King James English. And it, it, it's kind of weird the way they talk. Uh, I remember hearing about, there's no preacher, at, they used to preach at the annual meeting of the Church of God. We used to call it camp meeting back in the day. And he was preached on, he, he was invited to preach several times. And, and they, they realized that the, old, the longer he preached, the older he got, the longer he preached. And suddenly he was preaching two-hour sermons. And they said, you know what, boy, this is just, you know, you know, the heart can only take in what the seat can endure, you know, sometimes. <laughs> Two hours of preaching. So finally they said, you know what, we don't want to hurt his feelings, but next year, instead of preaching, we're just going to have him pay, pray the pastoral prayer. That way he'll be honored and we'll have him up front, but he won't preach. He prayed for 45 minutes. <laughs> Why? He, he wasn't praying to God. And I don't know, I don't know who he was. But, but it's almost though he was preaching and not praying. And Jesus says, you know what, this is a private, intimate conversation between you and God. Could it be that our prayers are supposed to be private conversations, intimate conversations with our Father? And now understand, there is power in agreement and in praying with others, but not for us to gain attention from our prayers or to impress other people. It's for us to come together and say, you know what, I agree with you in that. So we can pray together, but we should always remember we're not praying to be heard by other people. Jesus said, if you just want people to hear you, then you've already received your reward. And the Father says, I, I don't have to give you anything. You've already gotten what you wanted. Does that make sense? I hope so, because Jesus said it. You got an issue with it, take it up with him. But he said it. So Jesus warns his disciples according to this text. And he uses the term these terms of warning. He says, beware that you don't act this way when you're serving, when you're giving. Uh, sound no trumpet when you're giving. Don't let people know what you're doing. Do not let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Do not be like them, Jesus says. Do not heap up empty phrases when you pray. These are warning labels of servanthood. So if you and I are going to live lifestyles of servanthood, we have to heed these warning labels. Be careful in how we're serving. We want to avoid being hypocritical and insincere. When we are doing right, when we're giving and when we're praying with the right motives, then people will not see us and applaud us, but they will see the light that Jesus says that we're to be. They will see the city set on a hill. They will understand that we are not the salt unless we are sharing what he has given to us. If we don't have the right motive, then we become these people that Jesus says that the hypocrites are and that the world doubts and criticizes. And so there's some key questions we ought to ask when we're serving. First one is, who is your audience? Hypocrites want to impress people. They want to be acknowledged. They finish the grand introduction of their song and they jump up and say, applaud me. Aren't you impressed? Servants are simply doing what they are supposed to do. And the servants only are concerned about an audience of one, the master. Listen, what, what good would you do if no one noticed? 
if no one knew? Are we trying to impress God by being good or are we trying to impress others? Are we trying to simply fill an empty void in our lives or are we simply being like our master as his servant? We have got to learn contentment with receiving our reward in God's time and not in ours. Jesus describes the importance of secrecy when it comes to our audiences. Obviously, the people that we are serving know if we are serving them. But will we serve people if there is no audience, if there is no acknowledgement? I have, to, I have to confess that there are times that it ticks me off when I let a car into traffic and they don't do the obligatory wave and salute saying thank you. How about you? Just me? No, I see people pointing at others. It, it bothered. I have taken time out of my busy schedule to let you into traffic. The least you could do is give the wave. And if you are one of those who do not wave, shame on you. But you know what? Why do I need the wave? He said, now you've gone to preaching. Man, why do I need the wave? I've just done something good for good's sake. God noticed. The person who didn't acknowledge me, I don't know why, they, probably because they had their stinking cell phone in their hand. What do you think? Can't wave and talk at the same time. I don't know. Some of you are gifted when it comes to that. But I wonder, who is my audience? Jesus even says that the reward of having people noticed is all that we receive when we do good for their sake. If we want them to approve, then we've already received it. You got it right then. You got the wave. But if, if the Lord didn't get the opportunity, Jesus even says that this is true. But aren't striving for the same reward, of, aren't we all striving for the same reward of hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant? Which would you rather have? a person acknowledge and praise you or have God say, well done, good and faithful servant. I think sometimes I'm, I'm so concerned about pleasing people that I settle for less than what I could have. I, I, I get their thanks and I get their approval and I get their pat on the back and I get their, their words. And the father says, okay, you got, you got what you wanted. That's all you get. And it's not that I'm serving God to get from him, but I need to understand this principle that Jesus is teaching us. And he comes back to saying, how's your heart? Am I so in insecure in my status as God's child that I need the approval of other people? That's an important question to answer. Do I need people's approval almost to the point that it becomes an idol in my life? And God's up there saying, listen, I love you. I approve of you. I made you that way. I notice what you do. I know your heart's right. Why do you have to have everyone else's approval? From what I read here, Jesus is saying that if my heart desires to be seen doing good by others, then I am not seeking the Father's reward. Paul puts it this way when it comes to giving. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Why? The cheerful giver gives from the heart, not just from the wallet or from the bank account. He just said, I just give because I love you. And God says, you can do that cheerfully because you love him. When I'm practicing righteousness, I need to have the right heart engaged. When I give, I need to do it with a pure heart. When I pray, I need to do more than say the words. I need to pray from my heart. Anything else that I do is hypocritical. You, you might say, well, you know what, Pastor, I'm just not feeling it. Well, then that's a relationship issue that needs to be dealt with. And I thank the Lord for songs like we sang this morning that says, when I don't feel it, I still do it because it's the right thing to do. I'm practicing righteousness. Who gets the credit? That's an important question. Do I get the credit? Or do people say, man, isn't God good? I mean, if the guy playing the piano, if he would have just played that song and not stood up, I would have said, hasn't God given him incredible gifts? Instead, I said, I'll never buy his record again. 
Boy, I'm a narrow-minded dude, huh? You want to take me off? I have to tell you an old preacher story here, okay? You've probably heard it. If you haven't heard it, where you've been, that it bears telling again. The story is told of the pig and the chicken that went to church, and they heard that the pastor was going to have his birthday, and each of them offered to donate something towards the birthday. The chicken offered to donate eggs and asked the pig to give bacon so that the pastor would have a good breakfast. The pig looked at the chicken and said, do you understand what you're saying? To you, an egg is an offering. To me, bacon is a total sacrifice. (laughs) Heard it before? It's good though, isn't it? Illustrates the point. What are you giving to God? Sacrifice or offering? Is it enough for God to get the glory or do I have to have some as well? And, And I know that everyone wants to feel appreciated. But there comes a moment, Jesus says, in time where I stop being a servant and I begin to be a diva who has to have attention and praise or I feel wounded. Here's the phrase I want you to hold on to this morning. The Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you feel unappreciated, when you feel like no one cared, no one noticed, did they realize all that I have done? The Father who sees in secret, will reward you. I was driving down Central Pike on the way to the church the other day. They're putting in a new gas line down there on Central Pike somewhere. I think that's what it is. And I love watching people work with machines. I'm still a little boy when it comes to that. Man, I just like to park and watch them dig. But I drove by a couple, a couple of days ago, and there were two dudes down in, there, in that ditch. You know what they were using? Shovels. They didn't have the backhoe. They didn't have the machinery. Two men, can you believe in 2018, two men were digging with a shovel? That's hard work. I I almost pulled over and said, guys, do you know how much I appreciate seeing you do that? Someday all those people who have gas, natural gas run to their homes or their businesses, it's going to be because there were two men who were willing to not stand by and go, I sure hope that ditch digs itself. Two men with shovels And I don't know that anybody, I don't know if the boss came by and said, guys, do you know how impressed I am that you're using shovels? No, I don't think anybody did that because you know what their job entails? Using shovels. Do you know what our job entails? Serving others. That's what we're called to do. You say, well, I I didn't sign up for that. Then you're in the wrong business. We're in the ditch digging business, folks. Jesus said, washing feet. I say digging ditches. I say using shovels. I say doing whatever it takes to serve other people. And we don't do it so they'll say, man, aren't you impressed that I use a shovel? No, that's just what you do. Hey, man, preacher, that's good preaching right there. That just came right off the top of my head. I don't think it's even in the notes. (laughs) He is the Father. Now, Jesus says, let me teach you how to pray. We're going to wrap this up. He is the Father. We are the children. How many of you understand our relationship? That God is the Father, we're the children. Now, I know some of you teenagers get to a point where you think you know a whole lot more than your parents. How many of you are there now? Most of you, right? Yeah. When you get kids of your own, you're going to figure out your parents are pretty smart. But, but we do that with God, too, so don't feel bad. You can't help it. That's part of your life. We do that with God. You know what? I, God, let me share with you how this really should be done. I want us to look at the model prayer because the model prayer gives us the pattern of understanding how to be a servant. Jesus is teaching on prayer and serving in this text, and he says, all right, here's how we live a consistent servant lifestyle. Now listen, Jesus didn't say pray these words. He said pray like this. So when you pray, pray like this. The first thing is he he says we need to be as servants submissive. Our Father, we are children. Have you had a kid who simply wouldn't do what they were told? They were determined to be the boss. Yes. Have you ever had a kid say, you're not the boss of me? Yeah. Now, do you think that sometimes we tell God, you're not the boss of me? We should be submissive to who he is because of who he is. And so as we pray, we say, you're the boss, you're you're God, your kingdom come, your will be done. 
I want God's will more than mine to be done. That's a servant's lifestyle. I live my life in submission to his kingdom, his will, his position as my father. And so as you pray, you say, okay, God, here's what I have planned, but your daddy, and it's your will, and I want your will more than my will. That's a great way to start praying. Because if we don't, we start praying my will rather than his will, right? So we start out by saying, I'm submissive. You're still father. I'll pray that prayer. The second thing is dependent. Give us this day our daily bread. If we are not dependent on him, then we take credit for who we are and what we have. Listen, as a servant, we can't be self-sufficient. One day, the Bible says, doesn't matter how big your bank account is, how many possessions you have, how tough you think you are, how talented you think you are, the Bible says someday every single knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I would rather bow now than later. How about you? Servant, dependent. Now here's a hard one, forgiving. Jesus said you ought to always pray that you would be forgiving. Forgive us our debts. He said, let's stop right there. If I've done anything wrong, forgive me. But how does it continue? As we forgive our debtors. The story is told of two congregations that were located only a few blocks from each other in a small community. And they thought it might be better if they could finally come and merge and become one united, larger, more effective body rather than two struggling churches. It was a great idea. The leaders of the two churches got together and said, let's do, let's work on this. Let's bring these two churches back together. But they were unable to pull it off. You know what the problem was? They could not agree on how they would recite the Lord's Prayer. One group preferred forgive us our trespasses while the other group demanded forgive us our debts. So as the local newspaper reported, one church went back to its trespasses while the other returned to its debts. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Couldn't let go. Listen, let me tell you something. If you don't get anything else I said this morning, there is no greater act of service than to forgive someone who hasn't asked for it and who doesn't deserve it. Now you have served them. You have washed their feet. When they don't ask you, but you forgive them anyway and restore them. The last one this morning is careful. Jesus says, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. We always told our kids before they left the house, and we probably still do, be careful. We should pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is our area of greatest failure when it comes to how the world views us as Christians. It's because we as Christians get careless with our life. We aren't careful in our lives. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about being something you're not. I'm saying about being careful. You say, well, could, that, could I fall into trap there? Don't, I'm, I'm going to be careful and not even go there, not close. Let me tell you, if there's snakes anywhere nearby, I'm not going there. I'm careful. I walk through the woods. I'm careful because I'm scared to death of snakes. I can't ha handle them. I don't even want to be close to that. But we know we aren't humanly perfect. We know we will struggle and we will fail at times. But are we living lives that are obviously in submission to our master and our father? Are we honest enough in our struggles to let them see that we are real and we're not faking it? And so I want to ask you this morning what the counselor asked Sheila Walsh. Who are you? Who are you? You say, well, I'm at work, I'm this person. At home, I'm this person. At church, well, I'm another person. Ugh, be careful because you've lost who you really are trying to be all of these different people. And then I want to ask you, who is your audience? Are you living for his applause, for his approval? Are you living for others' approval? And I want to ask you another question. How is your heart and who gets the credit for the good that you do for Christ? and for others. We, we're called to this, to be servants. This is what we've signed up for. We picked up that cross. We went into that baptismal pool, and we were baptized, and we rose up to, to be called to be servants. How we doing? Who are we? Are we servants by nature, or are we just faking it? Let's stand together. 
Lord, we, we confess this morning that we are results-driven people. And we just want to see how well we're doing. We want, we want to know. We want, we want ac- acknowledgement. We want reward. Lord, maybe come to a new moment of brokenness this morning where we just say, you know what, I don't really care if I get the approval that I've always craved, if I get the recognition I've craved. Lord, I want to be broken to the point that I crave your approval more than anything else. And oh, how I want to be like Jesus who served, even as he hung on the cross, when he says, forgive them. They know not what they do. Recreate in us that nature, we pray. Break us of our own will. Our Father, you're in heaven. But we want your will to be done here as it is there in heaven. We pray for your provision. Give us this day what we need, Lord. And help us not to to worship things, but to desire what you want for us. Forgive us, Lord, as we forgive. And Father, would you guard us from temptation? Help us to see the boundaries. Holy Spirit, protect us. Give us insight, detection for the enemy and how he causes us to trip up. And Lord, may we strip away this morning all the masks and all the roles and simply be who we are, created in your image. In Jesus' name. You need to pray today. Of course, we always tell you there's prayer altars at the far sides if you want to pray alone. If you need somebody to pray with you today, these are the places if you want to come as we sing.
surely mercy right beside me all my days and I will dwell in your house forever and bless your some areas of your life as far as service goes. Me, I, you know, I mentioned that letting people into traffic thing. I'm going to be a more servant driver. My wife's holding me accountable for that. My grandkids hold me accountable for that. One, one of them told me, says, one day, he said, Papa, they're just driving. That'll hold you accountable, buddy. Because if you cause one of those little ones to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck thrown in the sea. So I'm going to work on serving. And I'm going to work on who I'm doing it for. So I hope you'll do that. Lord, go with us this week as we infiltrate this world that you placed us in on our jobs, in our, on our roads, in our shopping areas, in our homes. We want to fulfill this high calling of being a service. It's the highest call that we could ever receive because we are being like our example, being like you. And Lord, that's what we want to be is like you. And they will know that we are Christians by our love for one another. So, Lord, we want to fulfill that calling more than anything else. Send out your servants with the power of your spirit to be poured out, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.